thank you guys all so much for being here tonight. Moving on, let's do something here, guys. Are you, are you feeling okay? Yeah. I know it's yeah. winter, it's late, we're probably a little bit tired, so uh, can, we, can we do something right now? Can everyone stand up? Um, I'm going to call out a number, but let's make some space here. I'm gonna call How was that exercise? Uh, was it interesting? Why was it interesting? What was interesting about it? Because first of all, you have to think about your question and you can get to know yourself better. Did you surprise yourself? Uh, no. Oh. But you can get to know each other better. Thank you very much. At the beginning of, of uh, my sharing tonight, I said I hate introducing myself. Because if I just tell you things about myself, you'll forget them. Yes. If I tell you information about myself, you'll forget it. Does anyone remember where I went to grad school? No. No, I told you. Twice, actually. But you forgot it. Who knows? No. Michigan. No. Michigan. China. It wasn't China. I remember it was in China. No. You forgot because, frankly, you don't care. Why would you care? But if I tell you something personal about myself, you'll probably remember me. We live in our emotions. Our emotions are very important. And a lot of the times we take ourselves to work and we say, I'm going to put my emotions aside. My emotions don't matter. Your emotions don't matter. But it's not true. Your emotions are a valuable source of information. This is what I often tell my clients, is that your emotions are very valuable. Have you ever just had a gut feeling about something? Something makes you feel bad. Something about this deal makes me feel bad. It doesn't feel right. It's probably not right. There's a reason for it that your head just hasn't caught up with. Your emotions are very valuable, and we need to pay attention to them. Most of the people who leave their jobs, leave them because they're unhappy. Why would you leave a job because you're unhappy? What makes you unhappy? These are the things that managers need to be aware of. It's not about making your employees happy by giving them cake on their birthday. It's about creating a positive environment where you can actively share. So for example, in these teams, when you said, what are five things that make you scared? Spiders. <laughs> no one in your team said, no, you're not scared of spiders. They couldn't say that. Anything you said was accepted. So this leads me to the next question. How do we learn optimism? Well, yes, uh, like, like you said before the break, like you said, yes, we have to do things individually. We have to be proactive to show to ourselves that we can accomplish things. You're absolutely right. However, the social environment is very important. I dare say more important. There's only so much I can do for myself, but in a team, I can accomplish much, much more. If the team is supportive and encouraging, you'll learn faster. So in this uh, situation, your team supported you by saying, one, Come on, come on, it doesn't matter what you say, anything you say is okay. But say something. They're encouraging you to be proactive and to be honest. And then when it's over, we all had a good time. Right? Very interesting. So it leads me to, if you don't remember anything else tonight, what I'm going to share with you right now is very valuable. If you don't remember anything else, please remember this. Does anyone have a phobia? Does anyone have a phobia of something? What is your, what is your phobia, sir? Claustrophobia. Yes, me too. <laughs> Claustrophobia is a fear of tight spaces. Why? Can I have some explanation for this one? <laughs> sure, I'm sure you could share a story, maybe. If I told you, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Get in the elevator. What are you scared of? Elevators don't fall. You'll get out. It's fine. Would that help? They fall. <laughs> well, actually, you're not, you're not scared of falling. So I'm not scared of falling. I'm scared of the, uh, being stuck. And this can happen. Let's go to a cave. Yeah. There's nothing to worry about. Hundreds of people go into this cave all the time. They come out fine. Yeah. It's okay. Just go. Will that help? No. No. <laughs> it won't. In fact, I dare say most of you have a phobia that I've had to deal with a lot in my career as a coach. Public speaking. Oh, yes, same. <laughs> Public speaking is a phobia for almost everyone. <clears throat> almost everyone is scared of public speaking. Why? If I were to ask you, when did your fear of public speaking start? <coughs> most of my clients, most people, couldn't say. But I know it's a phobia because I work with children. 
A two-year-old is not scared of coming into a room and have being the center of attention. A two-year-old comes in, hey, everybody look at me! They don't care. You have to learn to be scared of it in your life. And so, this is something I had to deal with, and I, I was thinking, like, how is this, how do people learn a phobia? What is the process? So this is what I found in my research, it's something called compound post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so what happens is you start with an experience. You have an experience that immediately produces an emotion. Now, you can't tell yourself not to feel an emotion. If I say to you, go ahead, it's okay, go ahead. Go ahead, we're all listening. It's fine. No, no, don't be nervous, it's okay, go ahead. What's wrong, go ahead. Don't be nervous, there's no need to be nervous. Does that help? Never. Never, because your emotions don't come from your brain. It's the other way around. You have an emotion, and then you have an understanding. Your brain is just justifying an emotion that you have. What happens is you have an emotion in an instant, and then your brain goes, why are we feeling like this? What, what? Oh, it must be because. And it comes up with a reason. The reason may or may not be true or valid to the situation. But then that understanding becomes a belief, a generalized belief about the world. And then it becomes behavior. So what that means is that, for example, in my case with public speaking, you had many experiences where it was not safe to speak <coughs> in public. What's the answer number 12? Please, stand up and tell the class. Go on. That experience made you feel an emotion. Probably scared, probably very worried, anxious, nervous. But whatever it was, it was a strong emotion. You came to an understanding. Perhaps you aren't aware of what your understanding exactly is, but it generates a belief. Maybe the school system is against you. You're stupid. You're not smart enough. Math is hard. Miss Trunchbull is a terrible person. Whatever it is generates a belief which creates a behavior. And that behavior is you hate public speaking and avoid it at all costs. So 20, 30 years later, when you're in the business world, someone says, I would like you to give a 20 minute presentation in our meeting next week. You end up going like this. Hello everyone, today I'd like to share with you our quarterly analysis of cost. You've seen it a hundred times. So how do you break out of this cycle? Well, it go, it's a vicious cycle because then it gets worse and worse. Because of your behavior, you had another experience that made you nervous, that made you think you were bad at public speaking, which made you avoid it more and more, and it gets worse and worse with age. Same thing with claustrophobia. I, I have it too. Go into a tight space, it doesn't matter how many times I put myself in the elevator and come out okay, it just gets worse and worse with age. So how do you break out of it? Well, I got some good news and some bad news. The good news is, there is a way. The bad news is, it's hard. So, each one of these elements here is connected to each other. It goes in a cycle like this. But if you were to say, change your belief, you may be able to get at your behavior, or your experience, or something. You can change something. Maybe if you changed your understanding of the situation. Like, I used to be terrified of spiders. Don't laugh. I used to be terrified of spiders. Now I'm just scared of them because I learned about them. And I learned most spiders are not poisonous. Most spiders are harmless. And they can't hurt people. So now when I see a spider, I'm like, oh, it's probably harmless. So now I'm not terrified of them. Right? Many people change their experience. Scared of dogs because you were bit by a dog when you were a kid. But then you have a friend who has a dog, and this dog's really nice. Oh, maybe not all dogs are bad. Like I thought, not all dogs are dangerous, just some of them, because my nose are really nice, and so on. So you can get at these by addressing one of these issues separately and individually, and you'll see that as they're all connected, it becomes a holistic experience. Your phobia, you learn the phobia the same way you learn your talents. You play the piano. Your teacher said, great. Oh, you feel good about yourself. You think, I can do this. I'm smart. I'm going to do it more. I guarantee you, any of you who has any talent, it's because it started with a good feeling. Hey, I like this. This is fun. 
I love this. I'm good at this. And so you keep doing it, and then it becomes a part of you. So that brings us back toward the topic of leadership. So some of you mentioned some leaders. What is it about Barack Obama? I remember Barack and Michelle Obama. What is it about them that inspired you? Your uncles, your parents, whoever it is that you look up to, what kind of a character do they have? What are they like? Well, all the good C's, the good C words. Not what you're thinking, the good C words. Compassion, creativity, charisma, competence, the ability to connect with people. Chivalry, but I didn't put that on here. But they create a sense of community, conviction. They have these qualities about themselves because they have built them the same way that they, you can learn a phobia, you can learn confidence, right? That's another thing people come to me often, they say, Mark, I want to be more confident. How can I be more confident? Like, teach me a trick, should I stand like this? Does this make me more confident? Well, it's a start. It's a start. Yeah, it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's true, it's a start. If you've heard about power poses, something like that, yeah. It's not the whole picture, it's just one of the aspects of it. But yeah, it's better than doing nothing. You learn confidence by putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation, having a new experience, learning from it, and doing it again and again and again until it becomes a stronger and stronger part of you. And, and same thing. Courage. Courage isn't something you just have or don't have. Courage is something you practice. The same way you practice your phobias until it gets to the point where you don't even think about it, you just have it. Uh, so, my link to leadership is that you can be any of this. You can. You just have to start practicing it. Or perhaps you've been told, oh, you're not competent. Well, yeah, maybe right now, but nobody started confident. But you can do it if you just start practicing. Oh, nobody's, you're not courageous. Or you don't have any compassion. You're not an empathetic person. Well, yeah, sure. Doesn't mean you can't be. So, like you said about uh, challenges, so tell me, yeah, definitely take on the challenge of being more charismatic. Take on the challenge of building community. Go out of your way to reach out to people. Change the community that you're in. Sure, take that first step for yourself. Also, if you're the manager or leader of a community, be aware of what creates a good community and what creates a bad community. Are you encouraging people when they present creative ideas or different ideas, or are you shutting them down? As a leader, that's something you need to encourage in your, in your organization. Because once you have these convictions, you, you create a vision. And this is what a good leader does. They don't put themselves above others. And this is what I want to stress to you, is that you will have people in your life that have a status. They are your manager. You must do what they say. Sure. Yeah. But that doesn't make them a leader. That makes them a boss. Those are two very different things. I do what my boss tells me because if I don't, I'll be fired. I do what a leader tells me to do because I'm inspired. And that rhymes. Hmm. I should think about making one of those inspirational posters. Um, a boss can fire you, but a leader motivates people by saying, hey, here's my vision. Let me share it with you. We're on the same status. If you think of the great leaders throughout history, the Mahatma Gandhis, the Martin Luther Kings. They didn't make themselves a higher status than other people. They started by saying, we are all equal, and let me share with you my vision. Perhaps people like your, your father, your uncle, and yes, Michelle and Barack Obama, they didn't make themselves seem better than anyone else. They just said, I've got this great idea, let me share it. Here it is. And then what happens is once you start sharing it from a position of, being on the same level, hey, let's go that way, they say. Other people look in the same direction. And then they start to move in that direction. 
and then you start to see people moving in that direction, and then more people start moving in that direction. And then the leader is at the center, not at the front, not above, they're in the middle of it all. And they have significant relationships with everyone involved. That's what a leader is. So that's why I said at the beginning uh, of tonight, you are already at the center of some people. No matter who you are, you have friends, family, coworkers, your community. You're at the center of a group of people. You're at the center of a group of people right now, literally. And if you share your vision and connect with each other, you can move forward in that direction. So do you want a more creative or a more compassionate workplace? Maybe there's something that you'd like to change about your home or your community. You can start right now. Little things. If you have a conflict at work, don't run from it. Confront it. If you have a conflict in your family, show some empathy. Say, hey, let's talk about it. Because this is the way I want us to relate. Hey, you're my dad. I really care about what you think. When you talk to me like that, it hurts my feelings. That's a super hard thing to say. Oh my god, that's way scarier than any spider. But if you start doing that, maybe it'll make your dad think, and your mom think, and your brothers and sisters, and, the, and so on. Start by doing something nice in your community. Maybe someone will notice. And then they'll start to think, huh, that's a nice thing too. Like just a couple of days ago, uh, someone had left their pack, there's like, a, there's like these automatic doors that keep packages, like, like cabinets that are automatic that keep packages for people if they're not at home. And I saw one of them was open. I was going to get my package, I saw one of them was open. So I opened it, took the package out and said, hey, I don't know who this belongs to, but I saw this was open, so I just want to give it to you. I gave it to the Balan, the, uh, the gate guard. And he was shocked. And he was praising me up and down and saying, you've done such a good thing. Oh my god, I can't believe it. And I was thinking, what a small gesture. It's not a big deal. I mean, I was right there anyway. But I could see how that little thing affected him. So maybe you can do little things like that just as a start. And that's how you can be a leader, no matter where you are in your life. Oops, my back. So finally, to come full circle, 12 years ago when I was looking at this as being the epitome of leadership, and I was sad that I had lost that. This is what I have today. A small community of people who know me, who work with me, who have a great time with me, with whom I share my life. So uh, I'd like to leave it at that. And thank you guys very much. And I hope that you can take something away from tonight's, uh, tonight's event and bring it back to you in your lives. So thank you guys very much. And uh, I'll give it back to Clemency. Yeah, I think being a leader, maybe sometimes it depends on the environment, where yeah. you are, the situation. Um, I think sometimes in, in my family situation, I can <coughs> say I'm a leader. I'm, I'm not the, the oldest one, but then sometimes I find myself in a position where I take decisions that doesn't maybe even belong to me. But that's something maybe I acquire um, due to some respect that they give me. So they allow me to take some decisions yeah, yeah. because, um, yeah, for some reason. So I, in that situation, I can say I'm a leader. Sure. But then uh, it depends. Maybe you go to a workplace, to your workplace, and then it's, it's a different situation because you are in a position of being a leader there. And I think um, being a leader, again, it, it depends on the situation. It depends on the environment. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, so there's two things. One is status, and one is influence. So status, like I said, the boss says, you must do this or else there will be consequences. But everyone has influences. So perhaps your influence doesn't go up as much as you wish it would. So in an ideal world, you would influence your boss, and your boss would change their mind about something, and then you could change the whole environment. Uh, however, some bosses are not the best leaders. So that can happen, but you can still influence the people on the same status as you, hopefully. Um, it, like, like you said, it does depend very much on the situation, but that situation is social more than anything. Does that make sense? Right. Uh, 
So, for example, at work, every company has its own culture. And culture just means this is the way we have typically done things. So, for example, uh, I don't want to talk to my, I don't want to name my clients, but say I had two, two clients who were software uh, manufacturers. One, they said, it's very laissez-faire, come and go as you please. Uh, the campus is open 24 seven. Make sure you come on time for meetings and finish all your work, but we don't really care if you show up at nine or 10 or four in the afternoon. Doesn't matter, come and go as you please, we don't care. We have someone here, an HR manager, who is here to help you. If you have any problems with work or communication, they will assist you, that's it. The other company was clock in at nine, clock out whenever the boss lets you, and there's no HR manager to help you if you have a problem figured out in your own. So, which of those two companies do you think can hire retention of employees? This one. Of course. That something crazy like 98% retention. Almost nobody left that company. The other one, what do you think their retention rate was? Almost a third of their employees left every year. It was insane. So which company do you think is doing better? So in this case, it was because the first company had actually thought about creating a positive social environment. <coughs> and that's what you call the company culture. They wanted it to be positive. They wanted to retain employees. They wanted to have high uh, customer satisfaction. And some companies will say, oh, but if we, uh, if we treat our employees like that, it will, we'll have to raise their salaries, right? For them to be satisfied, they have to have high salaries. The first company actually had lower salaries than the second company. Mm -hmm. Because the second company had to offer you a higher salary for you to be willing to submit yourself to this torture. <laughs> and that's, that's just how like uh, the social situation is so important. And with families and friends, it's different because it's more dynamic, more malleable. When it comes to some, um, some environments, they're just toxic. Mm -hmm. And you need to get out of them. I'm sorry. So, so we learned that there's leadership and there's leadership, right? There's maybe negative leadership. Yeah. The second company led people out of the company, right? Yeah. And there's also unintentional leadership. Maybe many times kids are the bosses in the house, especially in China, right? They are leaders without knowing. Maybe they grow away from it because something happened. Or in his case, he was praised by the guard for doing something good. But many times you do something good and you don't get praised yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. And you don't realize that you're actually, you're actually being a leader. Because this guard was emotional enough maybe, or he took initiative to actually yes. praise him. Yeah, that was very because good. many people don't want to praise. Don't want to say, ah, oh, that's good or great. Yeah. And many people in that situation with, who help a lot don't realize that many people are actually just shy and don't praise you, but you've done many good things and you have actually led them to change. Because maybe the guard changed, but he is aware of it. But maybe you also made people change, but you're not aware of it, right? So just think about, uh, in retrospective, about other situations where you're, you've been a leader, unintentionally maybe, right? Anybody else? Yes. Taking my law firm as an example, uh, our lawyer, especially senior lawyer or partner of the, our law firm, do not talk much about work hard because we do it <coughs> by our action or performance. If we will talk much, you should work hard, you should work every day, even weekend, but you yourself don't do that. Do that, that way. It, it have no good impact. So we do it sell. Mm -hmm. If our senior man, a senior lawyer or partner work very hard every day, even over weekend, associates, junior lawyer, they will all know that. They will follow him. So this is a leadership. Yeah. Another thing is we should also show vision or show our way to handle a difficult situation. So that will help them not just to learn skills or just to read the regulations, but also let them know how to handle or solve problems. That is also a way to do things. Mm -hmm. That 
is also a kind of leadership to tell people how to do things, solve problems. Any, any, anyone else? Um, May? Yeah, you want to give an example? In the beginning you were shy, maybe you have another uh, idea now of something you've done. You came here for change, right? To hear something that might impact, impact you, right? You are a leader for yourself, like without, without praising yourself. Because in, in, in that case, somebody praised him. Many cases, people don't praise us. But also, there is a relation between you and yourself where many times you are helping yourself and you don't praise you for the help you've done towards yourself. And sometimes it's good to be aware of it and realize that and praise yourself sometimes and you're like, you know, that was good, you know? Thank you. <laughs> right? You can tell yourself that if you want. Anybody else? Be a leader, raise your hand. <laughs> yes? I would say uh, you can also be a leader by example. So you yeah, don't necessarily yeah. have to be uh, telling somebody what to do, but if you be an example and you show them that you are the best representation of who you are, then they can look up to you and learn from you. Yeah, actually, to, to your points um, about vision and, and that sort of thing, the reason why leading by example works so well is because of something called the, uh, the purpose content, purpose process content triangle. So imagine you have a pyramid. At the bottom is content. So you know, you know whatever it is that you are doing, the content of what you're doing, that is at the base. It's probably the most of what is done in an organization. Uh, but the thing that's above it that's more important is the process. How do we do this? How is it that we are achieving this content? Uh, and the top of the pyramid is purpose. Why are we doing this? What's the vision, right? If you're a leader, you need to spend most of your time at the top of that pyramid. Don't waste your time in the content. And a lot of managers make the mistake of telling people <clears throat> what to do and spending too much time saying, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, instead of saying how to do it. How do you do this? How do you achieve making your own content? And then at the very, very top, which is where you know, leaders should spend as much time as possible, is why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's the point? And so leading by example is important because if you are uh, demonstrating to people not just what to do, but also how you do it, they'll learn from your process. And that's more valuable because a lot of employees are unengaged at work because they feel like they don't have control. They're disengaged at work because they feel like, I just have to do the content. And I'm spitting out content all the time. And maybe I don't know how to do it. But I'm just doing it. And it makes them very unhappy. But if they can know how to do it, it makes them more happy. But if they know why they're doing it, that's when they get the most excited. So for example, if you're, if you're a singer, the content of the song, knowing the content, that's anyone can do that. How do you sing? Oh, now we're getting into something more interesting. How do you make your music sound better? But then finally, why are you singing? That's what inspires people. Motivation. Yeah, yeah. So if you lead by example by saying, hey, this is why I'm doing it, then people go, oh, that's cool. Okay, I like that. Makes sense. 